again, we're not saying, hey, this is this is it. We're saying, could this be um, part of the problem? And could it be a major part of the problem? And hopefully by raising some awareness, we start to see some of these studies with turkey poults and finding out whether this is actually hurting them to the degree that we think it could be. This segment of DOD TV is brought to you by Leopold, American to the core. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild podcast powered by DeerCast. This is episode number 220. We got a special episode today. Special guest, you're Tim Chelsvik. And you are Matt Drury. All right. So what do we got on tap today, man? We got Mark Drury and we got Dr. Grant Woods. They're joining us to talk about neonicotinoids. No, I could, <laughs> <laughs> we were having some technical issues before the show started and I told Matt, I was like, why don't we just do this show on our own? It'd be well, easy. <laughs> we can't even pronounce the word. So maybe we should bring in the big guns, the experts. This is a house of learned doctors. We do have a learned doctor on. We have Dr. Grant Woods. <laughs> Dr. Grant, how are you doing today? Hey, hey guys. How's everyone today? We're doing good. good. Thanks. thanks for joining us. Mark, do we got you on as well? Absolutely. Good Good to talk to you guys today. All Maybe, righty. Mark, you could work on getting some bigger deer up on the wall there. <laughs> <laughs> I will not try this fall. <laughs> I'd be ashamed Let's, if I were you. <laughs> right, yeah. Put that camera closer or something. <laughs> no, it's, it's great to get. It's great to have you guys on. Um, we're talking about. I know it's summertime, but we're talking about the decline in turkey population. Uh, Grant has brought up a very a very serious topic that has sparked a lot of conversation across the conservation world that we'll get into in a little bit but if you're at all concerned about wildlife populations not just turkey, you need to stay tuned to this show. Yeah, you know, we last week we talked that we were going to start diving into some heavy deer episodes here coming up, and obviously that's on everybody's mind, but I think the correlation is pretty obvious between this time of year and, and, and the things that we're all putting into the ground and, and mm -hmm. you, you, yep. you know what I mean? Ag in general, that, that's very pertinent to what's happening with Turkey population and beyond. So I'm looking forward to jumping into this one. Yeah. So, so we should say thank you to everyone who's given us feedback on the show. We love hearing from you guys, Jeremiah Austin on YouTube, uh, in regards to the Parker Smith, uh, show says the Smith family is such a good bunch of people. Very inspiring to listen to how humble these people are. Yee -yee. <laughs> that's right. So yeah, he's talking about the, uh, yee -yee episode a couple episodes back josh snyder the same thing on deercast he said dude if their podcast is as good as his youtube vids it will be right up there with the best podcast by dod wow. now you're making tim blush man that's some high praise all right let's dive into it timmy yeah and, and we should also say if folks want to join up uh, on the 100 percent wild uh, podcast crew on the face on facebook just follow the link here in the show notes that's right okay big guns all right so you know I know Grant and, and Mark, you guys text all the time and, and you're chatting. And th this is a topic that I don't know if Mark brought it up to Grant or how this started, but this is a topic that you guys were discussing uh, a few, maybe a month or two back, and it kind of prompted a much bigger discussion. So kind of dive into w what your thoughts are, how this all came to be. Well, I, I received a picture from Aaron Gaines at Analogics and he was just amazed at how much treated seed was in this turkey's crawl, you know, and I sent that to Grant and I go, could this be the issue with our turkeys? Because everybody knows the turkey populations across the country are really, really plummeting, specifically over the last five to 10 years. We went through some great years there in the uh, of growth with the turkey population, the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. But of late, man, everybody I talked to and I talked to turkey hunters nationwide, they're like, man, my birds are literally just disappearing. I, you know, we can't uh, can't find any turkeys. And uh, then, you know, Grant was, of course, already aware of it and started informing me, you know, the dangers of those seed coats. And then he went uh, several steps for further and released a, a Growing Deer TV episode about the hazards with with neonics. And I'll, I'll let Grant speak to it from from there. Hey, yeah, you know, I'm, of course, I love turkey hunting, too. And from Florida to Texas, New York, turkey populations are down in a lot of my favorite places to go hide out that time of year. And I have some good friends in Nebraska, big time farmers, and they started talking about neonics and pollinators. 
And, you know, serious guys, love to hunt, great guys, but big time farmers. And I started Googling Neil Nix and looking around and found some stuff out of Canada where they'd done some research and 65% of the adult turkeys that hunters had harvested, they found a, a pretty significant amount of Neil Nix in the, in the, you know, in the organs of liver of these turkeys. And that got me thinking. And then I started looking at the Audubon sites and whatnot. And turns out Neil Nix, a pretty small amount can kill a, you know, like an adult cardinal or, or grain eating birds. I'm thinking, well, man, a cardinal, that's about the same size as a young poke. And poets, of course, eat insects and Nenix is an insecticide. And so it, a Nenix is based on nicotine and it disables their nervous system so they can't crawl, fly, whatever. And that makes it real easy prey for a turkey poet to get hold of this insect. And they're getting loads of this Nenix. And so that's, that's kind of where I started really diving in more and calling researchers around the nation to learn more about this. Well, and I think it's important to state we're not pointing a finger because it's yeah. multifactorial with the turkey populations. And Grant talks about it all the time on Growing Deer TV. They got a lot of things working against them from habitat to, um, you know, hunter pressure to extended seasons to the weather changes. Uh, there's a lot of things, predator nest predation from all the different ground predators. There's a lot of things working against turkeys, but, you know, specifically over the last 10 years, it's really been dropping and there's been a lot of changes in the farming industry. I started texting Stephen McBee. Those guys farm like 41,000 acres in Northern Missouri. And Stephen was immediately saying, he goes, the stuff I'm spraying now and the seeds I'm planting now didn't exist five, 10 years ago. And we just started thinking, you know, could this be a major factor? We're not saying it is, but it does make you start thinking with all the research that's out there about neonics, you know, just what are we doing to our wildlife populations, not just wild turkeys, the songbirds, the bees, the white-tailed deer. I mean, there's a lot of studies that uh, aren't very favorable to, to these seed codes. Yeah, and you're exactly right, Mark. You know, it all starts with habitat. It's always habitat for every creature, humans, you know, deer, turkeys, or whatever. And and so habitat quality decline, either the loss, just the outright loss of habitat due to urban sprawl, suburban sprawl, or the decline in habitat. We know a lot of acres have been taken out of CRP or Gosh, we look right now out west, these massive wildfires is certainly setting back that habitat for a while. Now, it will end up being better. You know, it goes back to early succession, but a lot of habitat issues. So that's a stress. And then there are certainly more predators. You know, Missouri Department of Conservation does a, a scent station survey every year. They put out, just like you were trapping, lures, and they have a tracking pit around this stake, and they can see the tracks every day of raccoon, possum, coyote, whatever came to that station overnight. And those numbers are going up, 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 up. Where I live, we now have a bear season in southern Missouri. And, you know, that's kind of an issue uh, for us. We used to never have bears. And now we have too many bears. They're like big raccoons. They tear up a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, so hawks, everyone sees a bunch of hawks driving down the highway. We had a really cool video this year of a and I was watching the gobbler coming to the, you know, I'm outside and I still get excited. He's working it, coming into the calls and man, I'm, he's coming in my left. So I'm swung around that way. And I had a decoy out, but he's, he's just coming to calls. I don't even think he can see the decoy the way it's kind of a little slope there here in the Ozarks. And I'm just waiting for him getting range, you know, and I see some on my peripheral vision. And I hear boom. And I'm like, what the heck was that? And a hawk had come in. We had a GoPro set out there and a hawk had come in and, talons open. I mean, just right on the neck. You're thinking, well, how many times has that happened to a real hen out there? So there's a lot of things that like to eat turkey besides us on Thanksgiving morning. No and, doubt. Grant, maybe talk about the the route, like the etiology behind how neonics work in the plant, because it doesn't like they're the danger doesn't end after that seed goes under the soil and is no longer able to be you know picked up by a turkey that may be doing some browsing. Yeah, that's right. You know, so Ninix is pretty advanced science and it's a seed coating. It's pretty inexpensive, but it's built to be systemic. Or once that seed seed germinates into a seedling, the Ninix go through the circulatory system, if you will, the plant and go all the way through it. They're going to be in pollen. That's a big issue with, the, of course, the pollinator species. That's well published. And 
and it actually goes into the seed that plant produces. So they treat those neonic seeds really heavily. The seeds treated with neonics are heavy, so there's enough of that insecticide to infiltrate the entire plant. So, so basically once the plant starts growing, it, 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 you know, it's within the leaves, it's with the, you know, the pollen, it's in the ground that's in the soil. Like it, it just, it can continue to live well past, you know, when the harvest happens, right? It does. It's, it's in the groundwater, a lot of tests on that. Uh, you know, it's a very effective chemistry to go all through the plant. And that's why those seeds are, you know, if you ever purchased a seed that was neonic treated, it's going to be a really bright green. Some of them are bright blue. And that's a warning. If you read the label, that's a warning to tell us, hey, these seeds need to be treated slightly different than just, you know, maybe corn seed or wheat seeds you're planting from a silo that your, you know, your buddy harvested or something. So, and just to kind of qualify this, it's different. It's a different, when you say seed coat, that's different than like a Delta Ag seed coat that you put on, you know, your, your fall food plot Absolutely. seed. Absolutely. You know, and if you're uh, you know, you probably planting clovers, I plant clovers are treated with inoculant or soybeans with inoculant. That's harmless. That's a very beneficial bacteria to help those plants take nitrogen out of the air. It's called fixing nitrogen. Mm-hmm. We're talking about a very specific seed coat that's this insecticide, a particular insecticide. And, okay. and then and even even insects that feed on the plants are, are biomagnifying the neonics that are in the plant. So Yeah, that's right. So, you know, again, the 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 songbird scientists, you know, there's a lot of issues, South American rainforest, whatnot. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they're doing really intense research <clears throat> in many ways, way ahead of just turkey research, if you will. Uh, and so the birds that eat grain, like cardinals or birds with big beaks, they're getting that treatment right off the grain. But the flycatcher species, the insect eating species that have a real narrow beak, you can tell they're an insect eating species. They're made to pick an insect versus a, a big grain of corn. Well, they're eating all these insects that have been consuming or, you know, impacted by neonics so they can really biomagnify that insecticide. Do we know then what's, I know there's some research on songbirds. Do we know then what's like, what would actually happen to a turkey that has a bunch of, that has ingested a bunch of the, like, is it affecting their central nervous system? What's happening there? I'm not aware of any published research specifically on turkey pulps. So we want to share that and make that well known. <clears throat> We're looking at other species of, of birds, smaller. However, there is some research on poultry species, you know, chickens and stuff. They'll be careful while we feed them, right? Because it's going directly into the human food chain. And you certainly don't want to be providing any, this is well known, any neonic treated seed to the poultry industry because mm-hmm. it would have a negative impact on the health. And a lot of times neonics magnify their impacts by critters not being able to gain weight. Mm. It, it, you know, it impacts their, their nervous system. They can't function right. And one of the ways that's obvious is they just can't gain re- weight. Okay. Well, are, are, are there... Mark, go ahead. So I think I think it's important to note that again, we're not saying, "Hey, this is this is it." We're saying, could this be um, part of the problem, and could it be a major part of the problem? And hopefully, by raising some awareness, we start to see some of these studies with turkey poults and finding out whether this is actually hurting them to the degree that we think it could be. I mean, it's just a a basic assumption on our part, you know, given the research with songbirds and the insects and the bees, that this could be a major contributor to what's happening in the turkeys because it's nationwide. And a lot of these agricultural uh, uh, processes are nationwide. So, you know, whether it is or not, it's going to take some studies, but I think topics like this and that these conversations and the, the program that Grant did can start those conversations. And hopefully we, we learn through testing because one thing's for sure 
the ag industry isn't testing for it or not to, to the degree that we know of yet. They're not going to go test to see how it affects the wild turkeys. I mean, it's going to be us as a conservation group that will find these answers out. Grant, have you been contacted by, you know, anyone, the uh, conservation agencies or, or state agencies or even the ag industry at all since your video went out? You know, I have, and men so pleased. I've heard from several state agencies, actually, or at least someone in it at, you know, at a pretty high level. And it's all been very positive. Uh, some of the agencies are going to start prohibiting the use of neonic seed on their public lands, maybe waterfowl areas where they plant a lot of corn or something like that, and they have contract farmers come in. So that's, man, that's super positive for a lot of reasons. Uh One of major seed companies that didn't necessarily want to be named said that they will discontinue the use of all neonic seeds. That's a huge thing. Major, you know, ag seed company, not a wildlife seed company. So that's a major thing. And and wisely, they said they found a better alternative that will be less expensive to farmers. So, I mean, I love win-wins. That's a win-win. They came to this conclusion through pure economics and advanced science. Here's a more targeted insecticide that isn't going to groundwater or other things. And so that's a win for everyone, right? The farmers are paying less money. Everyone downstream is benefiting. And and as Mark says, if we can raise that awareness and maybe some smart researchers come up with good things and I'm chalking that up in the win column. So, so So Grant, don't our our neighbors to the North and Canada, do you feel as if they're a little bit more advanced in terms of, their uh, guidance to farmers and whatnot on neonics. I, I, I remember you saying their their awareness is a little more heightened than here in the U.S. It is. Uh, they tend to run a little bit stricter on these type of regulations and several referee publications, scientific publications that have been peer reviewed. Other, other researchers say, well, that's good research or that's not good research have come out. One of them I mentioned earlier about the amount of neonics in, inside of turkeys. Uh, they've done some work with deer and other species, and they're they're ahead. And you know, as a as a scientist, what I see oftentimes, people observe stuff in the field, users like us, and start to you know talking about it. And then someone at the university says, "That's a good research topic. I'm going to get some funding and dive into it." And even in my world, you know, way back in the day, three decades ago, uh, I met a guy that liked the research I was doing. And, and he, he said, I got this thing that will take pictures of deer at a scrape. And this is before trail cameras, folks. And, <laughs> and Mark remembers this. And, uh, and that was the intro to trail cameras, at least to me. And he sent me saying it took a 12 volt battery. You know, you kind of packed it out in the field with your frame pack. And you had 36 pictures on a roll of film getting deer waste one. And, and we published that in a science meeting, and that kind of got a bunch of stuff going. I'm not, in no way taking credit. I was just a guy that got to use it. And and uh, so when people out in the field, like this gentleman came to me who was an engineer that was a great deer hunter. He just wanted a way to get pictures of deer year-round, have a good idea. Then it can get into university systems where they can you know, put that heavy research on it. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Speaking of deer, are, do you guys see any concern about larger – Mammals uh, being uh, impacted by neonics. We've been talking a lot about turkeys and birds. You know, there's a, actually a, a referee publication now at South Dakota State University, SDSU, for you guys to Google it. Uh, and Dr. Steve Lundgren was one of the researchers on that. And they did some testing because they're worried in that part of the world with neonics getting into the groundwater supply. You know, it's widespread ag in that area, just thousands of miles of ag. And so they actually had captive deer and monitored the amount of neonics that were in water. They tested some from creeks and just supplied them water and added it. And they found a loss of weight and, oddly enough, a decrease in jaw length of of the offspring of those deer. So, yeah, it's powerful chemistry. And that's a published, you know, again, scientific publication. That's not hearsay or me out looking at some jaw bones on the back of a combine or something. That's, that's replicated research. So yes, it's potent chemistry. If, if someone's listening right now and they're now concerned, how, you know, how are they, how can they practically avoid neonics and feeding neonics or planting seeds coated with neonic coatings? 
Yeah, well, it's as simple as checking out the label on maybe you're planting corn or soybeans or asking your seed provider, do you have, a, you know, some seed options that haven't been treated with this insecticide? And I think we're seeing more and more of that. It's, you know, if you're a big time farmer, I'll tell you right now, it's difficult to get that quantity of field corn seed. About 95 percent of all corn seed in America, seed corn is treated with neonics and 50 percent of the soybeans. So. You have to work a little bit, but it can be done. And I think that will happen more and more as these more advanced methods get out. And my favorite, one thing I love to work on, I've applied it to my farm here for years, is what a lot of people call regenerative bag. We kind of call it the release process because it's food plot size. We've just scaled it down for guys like me that you know aren't planting 100 acres at a time. And you get away from the need for any of those insecticides and stuff like that. And and I got to tell you, I'm, I'm thrilled with my food plots and the deer I'm growing here in the Ozark Mountains, a rough area. Uh, there's there's better ways. And about five percent of cropland in the United States is now using regenerative ag. And that number is growing annually. And oddly enough, I think it's really cool. The government part of this 3030 program, I'm not being political at all is going to be changing some of the the crop incentive monies that are paid now to encourage farmers to have cover crops and some of these things that improve the soil. And just think about this, you know, if where you're hunting now is bare dirt six months out of year, and now it's got a cover crop of small grains and clovers, Nebraska's, whatever, you just went from X hundred acres of bare dirt to food plots that are making your deer better. And these plants are, you know, producing air, obviously clean air and clean water and building soil. So there's some real easy steps that I'm seeing take hold across America that are beneficial for everyone, not just hunters, everyone. Um, And I think that's the end game mm. is changing some of the farming techniques as farmers get comfortable with it, as they learn, because this is their income. I want to be super sensitive that this is their income. You know, if you come to me and said, Grant, you can't own a gun or a bow, I'd be I'd be really angry. You know, it would not be a pleasant conversation. And if you're telling a farmer, you have to totally change what you're doing, man, you're impacting that family's income. And so as they're learning and the science is advancing and people are seeing, boy, they're making as much profit. They're growing as much grain per acre, but have less money in input. So their net profit is higher. This trend is sweeping the nation. And in fact, the world in Europe, they're ahead of us because of regulations and really encouraging farmers to use the Regenity bag model. You know, we're, we're talking about how it affects animals, but how does it affect humans? If, you know, cause ultimately if 90% of the corn, 50% of the soybeans, like it's being passed down to consumption, human consumption at some point here. So are there any studies on how it may affect humans? You know, there are. I, I did not just really candidly. Maybe this is where I'm messed up in life. I didn't really scan or read those human ones. I was more interested in turkey or deer. So I didn't spend people. a lot of time on the publications. I saw some titles sliding by when I was searching for what I was looking for. But I'm a very practical scientist, you know. So, and Mark and I have talked about this. You hear all this stuff about glyphosate and Roundup Ready. Man, those were, those were some awesome deer days and turkey days. And even the European Union, just it was this week, early this week or last week, I forgot which one, after a like a multi-decade loan study just come out and said there's zero evidence, zero. This is what I consider a pretty protective body is maybe a way to phrase it. Mm -hmm. Zero evidence that glyphosate has any negative impact to humans, period. So. We've known this for years. It's the most studied herbicide on the planet 100 times over than anything else. And you get the midnight lawyers on the cheap TV channels, you know, saying, call now. If you've ever sprayed your driveway with Roundup, you're likely to die in the next three days and call (laughs) us now. That's absolutely not true. Please don't listen to that stuff, folks. Uh, So there's alternatives. There's good tools. Glyphosate is one of them. A lot of weeds have become resistant to glyphosate, so we need to move on to different things. That's where good research, and we got to feed the planet, you know. And I'm just looking, okay, there's X million people working around, eating whatever this, and we're not seeing it. It's like CWD, folks. If, you know, the people in Colorado eat a lot of deer and elk, and they have the same level, this is a published study, of neurological ailments as people that live in countries 
with no CWD, no, 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 not eating any deer elk meat. Mm. It's just not going to humans yet. I'm not saying it never will. Things adapt and change over time. But right now, you know, if I see a deer that looks sickly, I'm not going to feed it to my family. Otherwise I have zero concern. Yeah. So, so I thought it was interesting prior to the podcast, Tim, within the email thread we had going this morning, he mentioned DDT and said, this feels really reminiscent of the DDT, you know? So are we, are we going to see change like we did with DDT? And Grant said, yeah, a lot of people compare it to that, that same type of learning curve. Yeah, I think it'd be faster now, right? Because people talk more, the internet and everything. I think we're going to get ahead of it before we see that catastrophic response where eagles almost went extinct. And I, mm-hmm. I think we're going to get ahead of it much quicker. And that's where on the ground, you know, being planted by millions of acres of farmers is better than one university study. We can pull back and look broad scale and say, okay, pollinators are in trouble. Some of the songbird species are in trouble. What's causing that versus one study in one isolated area? And, 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 and like us, people can talk about it and share concerns. And once that gets a little momentum, then the big universities jump on it. And, you know, in a couple of years, which in the scale of everything is a pretty short period of time, get on top of it and make the appropriate changes. So I feel really positive about all this. And I think the appropriate changes will be made. So, so when we, you know, we put it up in DeerCast, uh, the, the growing deer uh, video, and we put, you know, we posted it over on social media and we, we had quite a response uh, across the board and, and not all positive, uh, you know, and, and it was kind of a wide gamut of, well, and you know, I'm not in ag country and, and our populations decline. It's a hundred percent predators. Uh, you know, um, you know, you, how about looking at yourselves as in the industry and how much you guys are promoting promoting turkey hunting and, you know, the shows that are jumping state to state and, you know, killing all these turkeys and filling their bag limits. How about the fall seasons? Like there was a billion reasons that people had to not look at (laughs) this reason. So kind of what, what are your thoughts around that? I mean, it's a, it's a pretty heated, it was a pretty heated topic on our pages, uh, more so than much more so than I thought it would be. Yeah. You know, again, I'm just, like to use huge data sets. And back in the day, Missouri was the destination turkey hunting area. People would travel from all over uh, to hunt Missouri. I mean, every pull in on, I hunted national forest at the time and every pull off at this walk in area, I hunted, it's called Piney Creek wilderness area. Actually, it was great turkey hunting. And you had to get there like two hours earlier. There'd be three truck pickups in the little <laughs> parking area, you know, and, and I'm, I love to walk. I was going way back in there. And yeah, we killed some birds. But back in that day, there was there was some logging. There was some early succession habitat. There was some nesting habitat. There was brooding habitat. And the politics on that change where there's no no logging. It wasn't a walking area at the time, I guess. And and so habitat has declined. And, and just look at some simple numbers. Uh, several states do what's called a, a poach survey every year or a brood survey. And, in Missouri, that used to be, you know, two or 1.3. The hens were having, on average, more poults survived per hen. So the population was growing. You could have a pretty big harvest. You could harvest a lot of birds, and it would still grow a little bit. And now, in some states, that's, a, that's a, you know, a 0.8, which means the turkeys aren't even replacing themselves. Mm-hmm. It's going down. And states have adapted. South Carolina, I went to school at Clemson. Uh, love turkey hunting down there. It went from a five bird limit to now it's a three bird limit and one bird the first 10 days. So states are adapting, but it's not an over harvest. If the habitat is productive, turkeys can make so many poles. It's just harvest is a non-issue. Like it was like we've already lived through this and we've had bigger turkey hunting numbers. I mean, we've lived through this. We have ample evidence. It's a habitat decline and and really candidly, again, just common sense stuff, you know, having chickens is a big thing these days and things like that. Um, they're all talking about predators. They're all talking about, you know, I can't grow hens in my backyard because the raccoons and the hawks are eating them all. Mm. Well, they're not just eating chickens, they're eating turkeys too. Yeah. And my family likes to watch Andy Griffin, you know, Mayberry RFD, and I was laughing the other day. Kids are home from college, we're just, you know, having a good time and they come on TV and it was an episode where really briefly Andy put some guy in jail and he got out of jail and he's coming down everybody's scared and he 
presents Andy this shotgun for kind of changing his life, for making him get on the right track. And Andy says, well, this is perfect for shooting those chicken hawks, <laughs> which was the accepting thing to do in that time. And now it's a federal offense. And there's a, and I'm not saying we should shoot hawks. So don't get excited. But <laughs> there's a hawk on every telephone pole around here. Every telephone pole. And like I said, we videoed a hawk, you know, coming in and just smacking our decoy this spring. Well, I got to bet the hawk population, I'm throwing a dart at a board that's triple, 10 times what it was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. literally. Eagle populations we know are up fourfold. That's documented. And every spring I get these really cool videos people send us of an eagle smacking their decoy. I mean, a bald eagle, a big eagle smacking a hen decoy. Well, there's a lot of things eating turkeys like we talked about that we're not eating them 10 years ago. Yeah. To me, and, this is a great example. Again, I'm, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but how hunters are the true conservationists, because here, here we are, we have an intimate and passionate understanding of, of what's happening in the ecosystems where we frequent and we're raising this flag. And, and in some cases it may prove to be a bit of an inconvenience for us, but we're putting that aside because we care about the habitat. We care about the animals that are in the, in those ecosystems. I, I, I haven't heard this conversation. I, obviously the Audubon society is doing something with songbirds, but we protect what we care about. And, and so here we are as hunters, we're not bloodthirsty, just let's wipe out all the turkeys we can because we love hunting. We love turkeys. We love deer. We love wildlife. And that's why, that's why I think this is so important. That's why I think so many people will care when they hear about this. Hey, you know, I love being out there in my bow stand and seeing a raccoon, you know, right at first light, sliding through the woods, going through its den tree. I don't like seeing 15 of them go by my stand. Hmm. So I think we need a little balance. Again, you know, back in the day when furs were worth more and a lot of guys were making their date money or whatever, their, their, their extra money for Christmas for their kids by trapping. Uh, and that just doesn't exist. That market does not exist at all. So, uh, you know, it's just a lot of things that have changed. I'd like to point out, you mentioned Audubon, you know, here in Missouri, Southern Missouri, about the same in Iowa. Uh, there's about 27 species of songbirds that nest zero to five feet off the ground. And I hear all this talk about, boy, those South Americans are cutting rainforests. They don't care about birds, you know, or windmills. They don't care about birds. You know, you hear all these things. And I'm thinking about how, how about us conservationists when the raccoon population is totally out of balance and they hear that little, you know, that little cardinal chick or whatever's nesting down there three feet off the ground. And that coon's going right to the nest every time. How about we take part of that responsibility and help those neotropical songbirds also? Mm -hmm. So uh, earlier off camera, we were talking about, was it South Dakota and a program that they had for teenagers? Share a little, little bit about that. I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, Mark may know more about that than I do, but they have a, a bounty system in the wetlands areas, you know, trying to predict waterfowl nest and delta waterfowl years ago decades ago did some great research that showed if they remove nest predators during the waterfowl nesting season targeted in these wetland areas they had a huge increase of chick survival huge increase and it makes sense right you take out some some things that are going around going what these eggs look tasty you're going to have more of them survive and so that, again, that research is well published, well known. And I think we have to apply that in a lot of areas, not all areas, but in a lot of areas towards the turkey and the quail populations also. Yeah. You know, something we haven't talked about much within this particular podcast, but it, it, it has a lot to do with the problem we're talking about, which is the, the declining turkey population is, is the decline in habitat um, about four or five years ago they reduced the amount of CRP acres in the country by like 25%. Okay. So if you, you think of that, take a quarter of the overall CRP acres with grass that's anywhere from this tall to six foot tall and just wipe it clean and start planting it again. All of a sudden you've reduced a lot of habitat across our nation. Now, uh, they're starting to bring some of these programs back and they're starting to increase CRP again. So perhaps mm -hmm. that will help turn the tide just a little bit. 
but habitat loss is a, is a huge problem. We mentioned it, but that factor that in and of itself, 25% of the CRP acres went away. I mean, that's, that's a big loss of habitat right there. It is. It is. And, 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 and in my world, how I practice, habitat's always number one. I'm always going to focus on habitat first. Hmm. Well, is there anything that we're missing on the conversation about neonicotinoids at this point? I think it'd be worth asking people out there across the country because if there's a silver lining, like I'm hearing about more baby turkeys this spring than I have in the last several and I don't know if Grant's hearing or seeing the same thing, but I, I think it'd be great in the comments to get, get a little bit of a roll call. What are you guys seeing in your neck of the woods for for poults? And then in the fall, let us know if the population still seems to be, you know, really high or really low based on what your poult survival rate is. So it's not just having those poults. Are they surviving? Which gets back yes. to what we're talking about. All the different, you know, danger from the air and, you know, danger from the seeds, danger from the insects. We seem to have had a good hatch. It will be a telltale sign, I think, this year to see if that carries through the fall and then into next year to see how many of those poults actually make it to adult life. Sure. Great. Well, we should probably help our buddy Darren with this week's question of the day. All right. So the question of the day is probably brought to you by Sportsman's Channel, your home for everything red, wild, and blue. Hey, guys. My name is Darren Ropp. I'm from Sheridan, Iowa. Uh, I've seen on Instagram, you guys are needing more questions of the day. So uh, my question is, uh, I work second shift, so I get off work at 2 a.m. And I've just been kind of curious if that would be a decent time to go check trail cameras after I get off work. Just curious as to what you guys' thoughts were on that. And uh, thanks. And I love the podcast. All right. Thank you, Darren. Uh, I have some thoughts, but I'd love to hear the experts' thoughts first. Mark, Grant, what do you think? Well, I think, you know, everybody wants to know what's on that trail camera. And if you look at different times of the year, I think there's a different rate at which which I would check them. Cell cams are obviously the best answer to that because you can check it daily. Uh, but if you don't have cell service or perhaps don't have a cell cellular camera, uh, then during the summer, I check my cameras about once a month. So if I got off at work at 2 p.m., that wouldn't stop me from going and, and uh, checking those trail cameras. Uh, I like midday as best I can. I always like tr checking them at a time when the deer aren't moving. Uh, mm -hmm. I also, I'm also very careful about not going in there on the wrong wind, uh, you know, to make sure you don't put your scent over the deer. But the frequency in which you check those cameras might need to increase as you approach the season because all of a sudden the whitetails start changing their habits. And as you reach the, the middle part of October and then the later part of October, I'm checking them much more frequently because the home ranges start to expand and the deer are moving much more. So hopefully that, that helps answer your question, Darren. And, and uh, a great, a great question at that. I actually met Darren last year during the fall and uh, he's a, he's a really good outdoorsman and a, and a nice young man. It was nice to have met him. So he's specifically saying he gets off off at second sh 2 a.m not p.m yeah okay. so he's in the middle of the night and and you're saying you know don't uh, go when they're out well i would think you know depending on the moon phase you know the, the 2 a.m might not be a great time to go check right now actually if you want to go check them at 2 a.m i drive up to that camera in my truck and check it and not think a thing of it actually so i'm sorry i misheard that it's actually 2 a.m like I do a lot of stuff in the middle of the night and the deer are out feeding. Uh, you drive by in a truck with lights on, they won't go 30 or 40 yards generally. So actually it's, it's not a bad time to move a set or check a camera. That wouldn't, that wouldn't bother me at all. I'd drive right up to it. If you have access to it. There you go. Right on. Grant, any thoughts here? No, I agree with Mark. I, my first experience long ago, I was down on the hunting camp of Mossy Oak and, you know, we just had a late talk and I was a new kid in camp And it's pretty late. And Cuff says, hey, let's go move. I need some help moving a stand. I, man, I just love code. Sure enough, we got in the middle of the woods at this camp and move a stand. And, and once I got into it, it made perfect sense because where we were moving it, deer were not going to be at that time of day. And he was moving it so it would be in a position when deer were coming off this ag field to come back through this bottleneck. And, you know, he could slide in there in the morning. But we needed to move it when they were not in that area. So like Mark says, it, 
just going in when they're not there. Yeah. All right. Very good. Can't argue with that. All right. Thanks for the question, Darren. Absolutely. So last thing. Let's go to the wildlife word. The wildlife word. word. And that's brought to you by the American Hunting Lease Association, your hunting access resource. Like if you're hunting, if you're a hunter, you want access to someone's ground. It'd be awful nice to go in when you're asking for permission, say, and I carry my own liability insurance yeah. that would cover you, the landowner, yeah. if there was some kind of accident or whatever, and you don't have to sign anything. It's a pretty cool, pretty yeah. cool deal they've yeah, got going. Absolutely. Uh, so here's the question. It's a multiple choice. Why do a white tail's ears go hairless during the summer? Is it A, their nutrition is spent on growing antlers or nursing fawns? B, the intense daylight stunts hair growth? C, it helps them shed heat? Or D, it helps them run faster. <laughs> All right. So, Grant, you're the expert here in white, everything whitetail. You're up first. Man, I, I think it's that run faster thing. No, I, I <laughs> get rid of heat. It's a huge issue for, for critters that size in the summer. Agreed. Mark's going with C also. And Matt? Well, yeah. I'm yeah, going to go with these guys. <laughs> He's not going to deviate. <laughs> yeah, they, they essentially serve like radiators, uh, uh, shedding heat for, for deer in the summer, trying to um, beat the, the difficulty that the additional heat. And uh, and that brings the, uh, the other challenge, though, with that is it makes them more vulnerable to ticks and biting flies there because there's just no protection. That's why, why you see those pictures just covered in ticks, yeah. their ears, their face. Oh, just, man. It really is a, a bad, bad deal for them. You know, when you step step out of the heat and get in your air-conditioned truck or into your air-conditioned home, think about those poor deer out there facing everything they face day in and day out with, with no breaks. Yeah. All right. So before we leave, I got to know, are you guys getting some giants on trail cameras yet? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Mine aren't out yet. Uh, Look at they'll you. They'll go out next week. Um, so yeah, I love, I never want to miss the first week of August. Uh, it seems like the deer kind of get out of their funk that they're in, in June and July, they start moving around a little bit more. Antlers are pretty much done and they're, they're a lot easier to get their picture in August than they are July. In my opinion. That's why I have yeah, things are looking great in the Ozarks, man. We've had a great growing season. We haven't had the floods, but we've had timely rains. It's, green i'm looking at a window now i mean the only negative is i got to mow the yard a lot more this year but it's it's really looking good here good good awesome. deal awesome i don't know how mark can hold off that long i mean I, oh, i'm I, fine holding off like through mid-july but like i don't know we put out a few cell cameras and it's just like ah the christmas <laughs> it, it is and uh -huh. then that then i'm getting real excited for the season so it's almost that trigger that says all right time to get serious so excited yeah absolutely well if, if folks didn't listen last week we had rick malik on longtime dod team member talking about how to manage a property that is kind of a distance from your home. So if you didn't listen to that, make sure you go back and check that out. And next week, we don't know yet. Who knows? <laughs> we do know it's going to be episode number 221. That's all we know at this point. <laughs> I have some ideas on who we're going to have on. Some more. I, want, I wanted to dive in deeper with more Drury Outdoors team members. We got some absolute killers on the team. Yep. And these guys are putting in the time, the work, w whether they're hunting small properties or leases or it's across or, the game. It's all over the board. So mm -hmm. uh, I want to start diving into that here in the month of August. And, and I think you're going to get some really good podcasts out of the Drury team. So so looking forward to it. Heck yeah. And thanks to everyone who's joined the 100% Wild Podcast crew on Facebook. Sorry for the videos that we keep posting in there. <laughs> all right. Until next time, I think that's all from here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Dr. Grant. Thanks, Mark. We appreciate you guys. We, we appreciate you all. And I, I want to say a special thanks to Dr. Grant. He has been such an influence to myself and Terry and Matt and everybody at Drury Outdoors. And you are a gift to conservationists and, oh. and to more enthusiasts like, like us. I mean, uh, we are lucky to have you. Uh, you know, constantly week in and week out, giving us knowledge that nobody else is really talking about. So everybody check out Growing Deer TV uh, because it, it's amazing. It's a wealth of knowledge. We appreciate you, Grant. Thanks for your friendship, Mark and guys. I appreciate y'all. Appreciate you. All right. All right. Appreciate you, Matt. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. All right. See you guys next week. We become best friends. Yep. Yes, we did. All right. Until <laughs> next time, peace out. DeerCast is giving you the chance to hunt with Mark and Terry Drury. Head over to DeerCast.com to enter. 
We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DoD TV was brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's.